Phyllis Bennis. She directs the New Internationalism Project at the Institute for Policy Studies, focusing on Middle East, U.S. wars, and U.N. issues. She co-founded the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights, which I'm on the advisory board of, actually, and now serves on the National Board of Jewish Voice for Peace. She has written and edited, and edited 11 books, including the just published seventh updated edition of her popular Understanding the Palestinian-Israeli uh, Conflict, Before and After U.S. Foreign Policy and the War in Terror, and Challenging Empire, How People, Governments, and the U.N. Defy U.S. Power. Our second speaker will be Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, retired from the United States Army, distinguished professor of government and public policy policy at the College of William and Mary in Virginia. He was the Chief of Staff to Secretary of State Colin Powell from 2002 to 2005 during the start of the Iraq War. And then our third panelist, Vijay Prashad, uh, is an Indian historian and journalist, author of 30 books, including Washington Bullets, Red Star of the Third World, The Darker Nations, A People's History of the Third World, and The Poorer Nations, A Possible History of the Global South. He serves as a chief correspondent for Globetrotter and a columnist for Frontline in India and chief editor of Leftward Books, New Delhi. So let's get started with the incomparable Phyllis Bennis. And Kevin, we don't seem to have Larry yet, so I'm still look, looking to get him on. Ah, okay. We may have to juggle the order then. Go ahead, Phyllis. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you all. Thank you to Peace Action. Thank you to all of you for spending what, at least here in DC, is an incredibly gorgeous sunny Saturday. Uh, talking about these crucial issues and what we as movements can do. Um, I'm supposed to talk about, among other things, an evaluation of Biden's foreign policy. I think it actually is still a bit too early for a real evaluation, but there are some new realities that we should be recognizing. Uh, and we do know, of course, that the Biden foreign policy, however it plays out, uh, is not gonna be our foreign policy, that's a given. The question will be, and I will end with this as well as start with it, is what our movements can do to make it better, to make it closer to ours. What I think we're looking at is that there's a, a foreign policy process underway that is shaped by real crises, real global crises, that are very different from the created, claimed military and strategic crises that the US claims to be uh, um, focused on. The, the US goals of projecting military power, expanding military bases, uh, the question of control of oil and other resources, uh, as we were hearing about earlier in Afghanistan and elsewhere, uh, maintaining global alliances that are designed to prevent the rise of, of regional uh, challengers, such as the case in Iran. All of these are the military and strategic crises that we are told are the basis for US foreign policy. The reality is this is a moment where certainly the pandemic, certainly global warming, but also issues of global authoritarianism, global inequality, uh, the global refugee crisis, which doesn't exist here, but does exist in many parts of the world. Uh, the, the, the rise of new wars that are, that are spreading around the world. All of those are separate from these US military and strategic goals, but they are framing a new world that takes into account all of these other questions. So we know that foreign policy is not going to be the first priority for the Biden administration for the first three months, the first six months, maybe even the first year. I had thought hmm, a long time ago, like a month, I had thought that what we were going to be looking at was more likely a scenario where the, the main priorities, the first priorities would be the domestic crises around the pandemic and the economic crisis that grew from the pandemic. And we're seeing a great deal of attention appropriately being focused on that. The racial reckoning that emerged over the summer's protests around the murder of, of George Floyd and all that has come from that is clearly very strong on the agenda because we're dealing with a new political moment. And the political moment is one that is shaped by a rising progressive wing within the Democratic Party, not yet a dominant wing, but with far more influence and agency within the party and within Congress as a result that we've seen probably since the 1930s. People of color have been elected, progressives are, are being elected, and the recognition is in the Biden administration 
that it's not only about who's being elected to Congress, but the very stark reality that it was people of color, particularly black women, who voted in the Biden administration. And they are having to deal with the consequences of that and know who, to some degree, they're gonna have to be accountable. We also have seen that as these two wings of the party emerge, the centrist right wing and the progressive and left wing, we know that on some of our issues, the movements in those issues have far more influence and power than others. So I would say that the, the two wings are closer to each other on issues around climate, immigration, the economy and healthcare linked, and maybe in a slightly lesser way, racial justice and labor issues. They're not together, but they're closer on those issues than on some others. Where the biggest gap exists between the two wings of the party is frankly on foreign policy, policies around war and peace, all of that. And that's an enormous challenge to us because part of that, not only, but part of that reflects the reality that our movement, the anti-war movement, the self-defined anti-militarism movement is simply not as powerful and not as influential right now as it has been in other periods. And it's not as powerful as some of these other movements. So we are dealing with that very stark reality. The key is going to be the role of the issues around war, the issues around military spending that we've just been hearing about, the $740 billion a year that we're spending this year that goes directly to the Pentagon. That's 53 cents out of every discretionary federal dollar goes directly to the Pentagon. So it answers the question of, well, M Medicare for all is a great idea, but how are you going to pay for it? Well, that's a start of how you're going to pay for it. How you're going to pay for it involves cutting the military budget. So that's kind of what we're looking at in terms of this political moment. We do see very important, powerful movements, the movement for Black Lives, the Poor People's Campaign and others are creating positions that include the question of cutting the military budget, ending militarism both at home and militarization of, of domestic as well as foreign policy. And we need to maintain and build on those relationships with those other movements to make this happen in a, a stronger way. I would say that some of the early executive actions that the Biden administration took were actually very positive, more so than I anticipated, mainly about reversing some of Trump's appalling decisions, but some also making things better, ending the Muslim ban, uh, some of the immigration moves, canceling the XL uh, pipeline, rejoining the WHO, investigating, starting an investigation of white supremacy within the US military ending the 1033 program where the Pentagon gives military equipment and weapons to local law enforcement. All of these things, although the 1033 one hasn't happened yet, it's probably gonna be in the next week or two. All of these things reflect an early commitment to some of what our movements have been demanding for a long time. That was quite positive. Then we get to the broader questions of policy, particularly war policy, particularly in the Middle East region, the greater Middle East, and things don't look so positive. In the Middle East, more broadly, of course, we, we saw coming out of the Trump years that the framework was all about Iran. It was about building up an anti-Iran coalition. It was the way the US was looking at the war in Yemen had everything to do with the anti-Iran coalition. It had to do with why Israel was moved in the Pentagon's mind out of the European uh, theater and into CENTCOM, Central Command, which is the military command that includes all of North Africa, the Middle East. Israel was always excluded because it didn't have decent relations with any of its neighbors. Now, because of the so-called Abraham Accords, the normalization of Israel in the region is well underway, supported by the Trump administration, and that has moved Israel into CENTCOM. The Palestinians are being abandoned and ignored. The question of the US support for Saudi Arabia and the UAE in the context of Yemen is on pause at the moment, but it's not over. The military sales are paused, but they're not canceled. So we're looking at a very difficult challenge. So let me just mention quickly a couple of specific ones around Iran, around Palestine, and then come back to our, our movements a little bit. So on Iran, 
I think there's no question that Biden really wants to return to the Iran nuclear deal, the JCPOA, partly because that was Obama's arguably his most important foreign policy accomplishment. And Biden, if nothing else, wants to claim, continue claiming credit for everything that Biden, uh, sorry, that Obama did that is popular. And the Iran nuclear deal is still pretty popular at the public level. So I think there's no question he wants to return to the deal. He has spent some political capital in making that happen. The appointment of Wendy Sherman as the Under Secretary of State. She was the one who was the, the head of the team that negotiated the deal originally. So that took a little bit of pressure. And then particularly the appointment of Rob Malley from the International Crisis Group to be the Iran uh, envoy to, do, to lead the negotiations. That took a fair amount of political capital because Rob, for a whole host of reasons, which we could talk about later, uh, was very much in the crosshairs of both Republican and Democratic warmongers who saw him as too soft on Israel, uh, too soft on the Palestinians and not strong enough supporting Israel, too soft on Iran, all of which meant he's a diplomat's diplomat. And that was sort of not acceptable for a lot of people. Biden's willingness to spend some political capital to get him in there was an optimistic moment. But so far, what we're seeing is that the anti-Iran momentum that Trump had kept in, 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 in motion, most particularly the crippling, horrific uh, economic sanctions imposed on Iran, not only the original sanctions from before the deal that, that went back into effect when Trump pulled out of the deal, but a whole bunch of new sanctions, all of that still exists. The Biden administration has not ended those sanctions and keeping the sanctions is by far the most important danger in making the possibility of going back to the nuclear deal uh, much more difficult. The, the most important component right now has to do with timing. You know, the Iranians after a certain point with the US abandoning the deal and walking away from it, said to the Europeans, if you can't make good on your commitment to compensating us for what these US sanctions have done to our economy, which has led among other things to the death of children for the first time in modern Iranian history, children have died of malnutrition, and a lot of people have died from the inability to get medications and equipment in hospitals. Not because they're not explicitly excluded from the sanctions officially, but in the real world, those exclusions don't matter. Banks and companies that produce crucial medicines are just not willing to take the risk that the US is not gonna hold them accountable for sanctions violations and try to arrest their CEOs or impose multi-million dollar fines or God knows what. So the US is directly responsible for the impact of sanctions on people in Iran. And it's for that reason that the politics inside Iran with elections coming up in June are going to be so tricky, so tricky. So the whole question of how that's going to play out in this very short window is, remains a very, very crucial question. And it's one that's not looking very good right now. It doesn't we don't seem to see any evidence that there are backdoor talks underway. On the question of the so-called forever wars, uh, there was an executive order that called for reviewing the counterterrorism operations. You know, one of the problems that we face, there's a lot of talk and has been for a while about withdrawing troops, particularly from Afghanistan, which is good. There's 2,500 troops, US troops left in Afghanistan that are not keeping Afghans safe. They're certainly not keeping people in this country safe. But they're not, in a certain way, the real problem. The death of civilians that are accountable to the United States is not being carried out by those 2,500 ground troops who are basically backing up uh, uh, local forces and, and training them. It's coming from air wars and drone wars. And there's no talk about ending that. When we hear talk about pulling out the troops, we have to keep saying over and over again, and end the drone war and end the air war that is in fact killing civilians every day inside Afghanistan. Uh, so that's going to be a major, a major challenge. Right now the US is saying, the Biden administration is saying they're likely not to, to pull out all the troops as they had agreed, as the Trump administration had agreed to uh, in the deal with the Taliban, that they want an extension. And if the Taliban refuses, they may refuse it anyway. And it's the same in a sense as what the Iranians are facing with where Biden says, look, those were, those were Trump sanctions. We're different. We're not Trump anymore. 
And the Iranians are saying, those are US sanctions. The Taliban is saying the same thing. You may not like the agreement that your former president signed, but he was the president and he signed that agreement. And therefore you're bound by it. And the US is saying, actually, maybe not so much. So we have a serious problem with that with the Biden administration. There's some potential around Yemen because there's a lot of popular support for ending all US support for the Saudi war in Yemen, but we don't know how that's gonna play out. Congress voted in both houses to end that support. Again, not including ending the air war, the separate air war that the US says is the counterterrorism part. So we have to continue that as if, as if there was in fact a military solution to terrorism, what we all know is not true. But there's a potential there because Congress is supporting it. It's gonna take a lot of work to make good on any of those promises, even around Yemen, which might be the lowest hanging fruit of all of them. On Palestine, we know that there has been an enormous discourse shift. There's new members of Congress who have been elected, not only the squad, but new members in this last election uh, who are much more clear that whether it was ever true or not, it is certainly no longer true that criticizing Israel is a, uh, an act of political suicide. And there is now talk in Congress about moving towards a series of acts that would lead to conditioning US military aid to Israel on human rights terms. So making sure that we don't treat Israel differently than every other country. What many of us are accused of sometimes, you treat Israel in ways that you never treat any other country. In fact, it's the people who want to maintain the $3.8 billion a year in military aid to Israel that are treating Israel differently than every other country. Our position is, my position is, we shouldn't be sending arms to any country and particularly countries that violate human rights. We shouldn't be sending uh, military aid or selling arms to Saudi Arabia, to any of these countries. So we are just saying, treat Israel like every other country. And now there are people in Congress who are making that, as a, making that real as a, as a possibility. The discourse has shifted in a very partisan direction so that we know that in, in recent polls, 61% of Republicans had a favorable view of the Israeli government, while only 26% of Democrats said the same thing. That's a huge shift from the, the bipartisan uh, position that, that we've seen for so long. And we know that we are now seeing people being elected with that as a component of their, of their campaign position, younger people, black members of Congress, other members of color. And that's a real shift that we have to take advantage of because at the same time that we're seeing these victories in the public discourse, the political discourse and political action has not yet changed. And that's the enormous point of challenge for all of us is to make that political shift real out of the public and media discourse shift that is underway. So that means a lot of work for our movements at a moment when our movements are being attacked quite viciously by supporters of US aid to Israel, et cetera, the pro-Israel lobbies, in the, in the uh, Christian Zionist movement, the, in the evangelical community, in the Jewish community, but even there, particularly in the Jewish community, there's a massive shift underway where young Jews are no longer assuming that their identity as Jews has to be bound up with support for Israel. You have organizations like the organization I work with, Jewish Voice for Peace, staking out a position that is grounded in Palestinian rights. And as long as we keep our focus on the question of rights, on the question of equality, not getting caught up in all this debate about one state or two states, red state, blue state, but keeping it on equality for all and the rights of Palestinians, we will be able to build an ever stronger movement. So let me end with just a bit on this question of the, the challenges and the dangers we're facing. On the question of the military budget, which as Kathy and others were saying earlier, is so crucial in building the work of all of, the, all of our related movements whether it's Medicare for all, whether it's the Green New Deal, paying for all those things has to start with cutting the military budget. There was a move last year to cut it by only 10% and it reached 93 votes in the house, which was quite extraordinary given that there's never been that kind of a vote on cutting the military budget at all. But of course, 93 votes isn't close to what you need to pass it. And 10% is really not very much. 
except when you're talking about 10% of 740 billion dollars, you're talking about a lot of money. That is not chump change. So 10% is not a bad start. The Poor People's Campaign, the Institute for Policy Studies, and many other organizations are calling for 50% cuts, that we should be cutting 350 billion out of that 740, and we'd still be a lot safer. So that's one of the things that we have to keep central, I think, in all of our work. And then finally, it comes back to this question of our movements. What our movements are going to be able to do to make good on the political moment that we find ourselves in. First, we have to force this administration to make good on the promises they made about Yemen, about Saudi arms, about the Paris uh, climate deal, about Cuba, about withdrawing troops, about Iran and the nuclear deal that was supposed to be on day one. All of that depends on our movements. We're gonna have to fight just for the things that Biden already said he would do, but hasn't done yet. There, and he's not gonna do it unless we fight for it. They're gonna have to make concessions. They're gonna have to know that people in this country will support those concessions. We have to work with our movements in a global way. We have to make sure that the movement for black lives, that the that 350.org and Sunrise and all of the movements in the, in the climate justice movement and others are getting everything they need to show what we've known for a long time about the links between climate and militarism. That's on us, that's our job to work with all of these other movements and to support the new younger anti-war movements that are rising, dissenters, uh, justices global, that are made up of, of young people, people of color primarily, in all the ways that our legacy anti-war movements have talked about needing to bring in younger people and more people of color. They're creating their own organizations and we have the opportunity now to, to help them build and to be part of this broader movement moment that we're seeing. And at the same time, build internationalism into all of our movements. We have a lot of work to do.